This is She Creates Business, a podcast for wedding pros. Your host, Kinsey Roberts, interviews incredible women in the wedding industry who are making their mark and creating success on their terms. Join the conversation. Hello there. Welcome to episode 170 of She Creates Business, a podcast for wedding pros. This is your host, Kinsey Roberts. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. I know you have oodles of choices when it comes to podcasts to listen to. So the fact that you're here listening to this one, I just, gosh, I just really appreciate it. Just thank you. I haven't said that in a while. And I want you to know how much it means to me that you stop by and hang out with me and, and whatever guest I have on the show at the time. And I know we, we all appreciate it. Thank you very much. Hope you're doing well wherever you are. Listen, today's episode is with my friend, business colleague, fellow wedding pro, Megan Gillikin. Megan Gillikin is somebody who, this is her third appearance on the podcast. She is a very well-known wedding planner in her market. She's been a wedding planner for over 10 years. She runs the business of Southern Soiree. She's also a trainer for other and consultant for other wedding planners. She runs a membership site called the Planner's Vault, which I am a member of and a very proud partner and affiliate for. We talk a little bit about the Planner's Vault in this episode towards the end because I've had a lot of questions about it. People are really looking for community. They're looking for somewhere to go to ask questions because it seems like we have a new sort of issue or problem that we need to solve daily as wedding pros right now. And so I've had a ton of questions about where can I go to actually grow my business, but also get some support and just ask questions and just have, you know, solution seeking people and not people who just want to kind of complain. Um, And that's the planner's vault, in my opinion. Like I said, we talk more about it. So I'll let you listen to that towards the end end of the episode. But I would love for you to go to theplannersvault.com forward slash she creates business. Sign up for the wait list. It's going to launch again on August 5th, 2020. And if you join us in there, I know you won't regret it. It's for planners who are zero to five years in business. Though I will tell you, we keep seeing more planners with more experience come in and they're sort of like leading learners in the group. They're still getting a ton of help and a ton of value and, and learning new ways to grow their business. But they're also there to um get the same thing that all of us need, like I said, which is that community piece. So I'll put the link in the show notes. If you are someone who said, I want to grow my business, I'm not giving up, but I also need a place to ask questions. I want to be around solution seekers, people who are not, you know, positive to the point of distraction, but they're also not, you know, sitting down and like wallowing in their misery. That's not my thing, you guys. Um, So if you're with me, uh, come on over, theplannersvault.com forward slash she creates business. Today's episode, oh my gosh, my heart just started beating kind of fast. Um, Today's episode is interesting. It's what is entrepreneurship costing you? Entrepreneurship is going to cost us all something uh, at one point or another. Gonna, you're going to give up something. You're going to sacrifice something. You're going to learn a lot of hard lessons. And you may even find out that what it is costing you is not worth it. It's not, you know, entrepreneurship isn't worth the toll. And I hope that if that is you, that you take action on that and you either relegate your business to a side hustle, you give it up. I want you to have a happy, healthy life. And entrepreneurship can cost us a lot. Um, if you re- resonate with any of the stories Megan and I tell today and you need someone to talk to, just let me know. Um, it's hard to go through stuff alone. And I just want you guys to know we share some personal stories in today's episode. I have never gotten this personal on the podcast ever. I um, hope that's okay. Let me know. But entrepreneurship is costing you something. And good or bad, pros or cons, it can cost you good things, it can cost you bad things. Uh, it can, you know, it can deliver really amazing lessons, it can be really hard fought lessons. And we're here to just say, hey, we've, we've been there, we're still there, we're working through it. It's not all rainbows and unicorns. And here are the some, here we also give you some of our thoughts on what Megan and I are changing for ourselves and our businesses in the next year and the next two years, because what entrepreneurship has cost us in the past isn't something that we're willing to continue to pay. Um, So I hope you enjoy this episode. Let's get to it. 
This is me and Megan Gilligan from the Planner's Vault and a Southern Soiree talking about what entrepreneurship is costing you. Here we go. Megan, welcome back to the show. Kinsey, you know I love being here. I love having you here. It is, I always enjoy our conversations and I think I've told you this before. I hope I have. Um, maybe we have both said it. I always feel energized and uh, motivated and happy after our conversations, even if they're kind of tough topics, because you and I are real life friends and online friends. And so we have really gotten to know each other personally and professionally. And so we, we do talk about some heavy stuff sometimes, but no matter what, like I always just feel motivated, energized, ready to go after our talk. So I'm glad we're going to do this one for the podcast. There's something about a safe space with a friend where you can be yourself, let your guard down and have them sometimes tell you things that you need to hear, but you maybe you weren't ready. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Because then you, even if you're, even if you're not ready, when they tell you having that safe space, you, you know, you're safe there and you don't feel like sometimes for me as an eight on the Enneagram, I can kind of feel like a wild animal when somebody tells me something I'm not ready to hear because I'm just like, nope, don't get in my face. <laughs> uh, but if, but if you, and so I always need, you know, someone like you, my husband, people who are close to me uh, to share those things with me because you, you're right. You need to hear them even if you're not ready. Yep. It's yeah. true. Yeah. So, you know, that being said, this, this podcast episode, what is entrepreneurship costing you? This might be something you need to hear, but you are not ready. And I hope you'll stick with us because Megan and I are just here as your friends. We're here as your contemporaries. We are not here. I think this is super important. I don't want to speak for you, Megan. So you tell me if I'm wrong, but I am like total like hands up. I'm just here as your contemporary, the person who's also working through this. I am not here as you know, someone who has like made it out on the other side and I have all the answers. Let me guide you through. That is 1000% not me. I'm still going through a lot of this um, and still actively working through it. And I think that the best way to put it is that I feel like I'm just learning alongside you. And so I hope that you will take what you need from this uh, episode and leave the rest. Honestly, if you don't like any of it, turn it off and go listen to something else. <laughs> um, because yeah, like I said, I, I don't feel like I'm here. I'm not trying to guide you through anything. I think we're just trying to share from our hearts and hopefully it, it resonates with you in one way or another, because we've been going through a hard season, all of us, wedding industry. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, I definitely, I definitely agree with what you're saying. A, a work in progress, 100%. Mm. And living through some of these uncomfortable moments and uh, our current environment has brought up even more of those. Right. But yes, I think our offline conversations about some business struggles and some of the, the dark parts of entrepreneurship and some of the highlights too, I think that's what brought this episode to life. That's right. And as we record this, it's July 2020. So we are actively going through COVID-19 and coronavirus crisis. And that's what we're kind of talking about when we say hard season. So if you're listening to this in the future, the great news is hopefully coronavirus isn't a thing um, or, you know, we're, we're past it in a more healthy way or uh, so, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be an international pandemic for us to really take assessment of our life. But if I could say one positive that has come out of this season for me, and I think, you know, for me, the impetus of this episode is that when you have more time, when you're not you're just, you know, crushing weddings all summer and not even thinking, you're just doing, um, it has really made me self-reflect, which I think is why you and I have had a lot of these conversations recently is because we've, we've had the time to just sit back and say, hmm, we, we started it, which you guys will learn. Like we started these conversations pre-coronavirus, but then we really had we really had time and space to think, okay, this was like this little voice in my head um, was right. Yeah. I mm -hmm. think that one of the goals that I would have for this episode and a goal that has come out of all of this for me is taking a moment, like you said, you have the space to evaluate your why and then what comes next. Yes. That is always the thing. Okay. I love that. I, uh, so many people always say like, what is your why? Find your why. But no one says it like you do because nobody, I hear very few people say, then what comes next? 
because mm-hmm. you have to take that next step. You have to take that next ap- action if you want your why. It's not just find your why and everything will fall into place. Yeah, you can't just sit with your why and be like, cool, check, done. Yeah, done, <laughs> found my why. Now right. what's, you know, my life's going to change or what? <laughs> I like that a lot. So we're going to talk about what on- what is entrepreneurship costing you? We're going to share some personal stories. I hope that's okay. Before we get started though, we have a quote. Megan found it it's her brainchild from Brene Brown. And we just wanted to share part of the quote. This is not the full quote, but we wanted to share part of it so you can kind of sit with it as we work through this because it resonated super deeply with both of us. Yes. So this comes from Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. I love, love, love Brene. And I listened to this on an audiobook actually this morning. I've started this routine of going for a walk and taking 30 minutes to just kind of get the day started and get my mind right. And I find a book that does that for me. And um, this quote goes like this. Perfectionism is self-destructive simply because it doesn't exist. It's an unattainable goal. Mm. Yes. Um, Like I said, that's just part of the quote. Do you want to read any more of it? Oh yeah, let's see. Perfectionism is more about perception than internal motivation, and there is no way to control perception, no matter how much time and energy we spend trying. Here's this last part that ties to it. Rather than questioning the faulty logic of perfectionism, we become even more entrenched in our quest to look and do everything just right. Yeah. I just took a pause there because I wanted that to sink in. I love, yeah, I'm going to, just for you guys, we'll put this quote in the show notes and I will also put a link to the book. It's not an affiliate link uh, in the show notes too. So it's Dare to Lead by Brene Brown, if that's something that you're interested in. But, you know, one one of the parts of that quote that really resonates with me because I do want to be in control all the time is that perception is impossible to control. Perception is impossible to control because perception is what another person thinks of you and you and I even say this to other people, but sometimes it's hard for me to like say to myself, you are not in control of other people's feelings or actions. Like that is a lost cause. Yes. I actually just spoke about this in a podcast I recorded and it's a common theme in my house with my girls. So I have three girls, eight, five, and two and a half. And I say to them like in all sorts of situations, because this was not said to me as a child. It's more something that I say to myself now is, yeah, you can only control your actions and your reactions and your plans. You have zero control over other people. And I think that that, uh, especially in this current environment that we're all in, that's been a hard pill to swallow for, for all of us. For all of us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially when you're going through really hard conversations and people are, you know, maybe you guys resonate with this. If you've been going hard through hard conversations with couples that you're serving right now and they they begin to attack you personally, um, that can take its toll. You know, if you're somebody who, if you have to talk to dozens and dozens of people a week or what have you, or even a couple people a week, uh, that can start to take its toll. So I think it's really important to, to differentiate, to differentiate, um, to understand the difference between fact and feeling. So they may feel like, and they may be approaching you like it's your fault. And this is not just this certain, certain season, but you know, it may feel like they are personally attacking you, but the fact is they're just upset about the situation and they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Um, So anyway, well, so what is entrepreneurship costing you? And if you don't like the word entrepreneur or entrepreneurship, you just insert whatever word you like. What is small business ownership costing you? Um, What is, you know, wedding pro business owner costing you? Whatever you want. You know, some people are like, oh, I don't like to be called an entrepreneur. Um, I thought that just is a catchy title, you guys. (laughs) Um, but so myths, we wanted to start out with some myths of small business ownership, some myths of entrepreneurship, because there's a lot. And there's also a lot of contradictory messaging about being a small business owner, about being an entrepreneur, especially for women. Um, and, you know, we just have a different role in the world and we, we see and re- are responsible for different things. And so, um, and, and we're speaking as women. So, you know, if you're not just, you know, take it, take this for what it is for you. Like take, like I said, always say, take what you want, leave the rest. Um, I think one of the myths of entrepreneurship is that it's super easy. It's too, it's easy, right? Like you just set up a business, a passive income, easy. 
What's that quote? I don't know. I'll, I'm sure I'll butcher this, but what is it? Like when you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. Isn't, Burn that quote have you to heard the ground. That? Yes. <laughs> I, know, right? I hate it so much. <laughs> I hate that quote too. Who said that? I hate that, that quote. Who said, yeah. No, that's just not accurate. Like, listen, work is work. Work will be work. I mean, I don't, I think that, and this will kind of lead into some of our other quotes, but yeah, work, work is work, even if you own your own business. Yeah. And there will be days where, yeah, it doesn't feel like you're working because you love it so much, but there will be days where you want to pull out your eyelashes. Yes. There, there are definitely parts of entrepreneurship that are going to be a struggle and there's no avoiding that. There's no avoiding that. And the great, here's the thing. I feel like you shouldn't be avoiding that. You shouldn't be avoiding that. It's Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that, I mean, what comes easy is never really worth it. And I think that, uh, I think what, you know, something that I've heard is that, you know, if you, if when you share, I mean, this is kind of a simplistic example, but if you just now publish your, like if you wait six months to publish your first live, or if you wait six months to publish your first YouTube video or what have you, and you're completely satisfied with it, you're like, oh my God, that was perfect. I did so great. Then you waited way too long. Like you have to take messy action. It should be hard. It should feel kind of like a grind sometimes because you're learning. And if you're not learning and growing, like you're dying. Um, and so I, I think that, yeah, that, that, that entrepreneurship is easy, that everyone should do it. Everybody should own a small business. I, I think that's a myth and I don't think that's true, which part of that myth for me, it goes back to, I think I've said this on the podcast, especially lately because of coronavirus, because of like my one-on-one clients and what their struggles are, is that entrepreneurship and small business ownership doesn't have to be for you. You are not a failure if it's not it's okay to go get a full-time job. It's okay to have a full-time job that's amazing and also have a side hustle that's amazing because holla, double the revenue. Um, You know what I mean? Like, I think Mm -hmm. that that kind of goes along with it for me. But uh, another myth is that it's also super hard or it should be crazy hard. And by hard, I mean, it requires 24 seven commitment and sacrifice from you as the business owner in order to be successful. If you are not sacrificing everything, you're never going to be successful. Yes. I have had my business now 10 years, 10 years. And I have referred to it for years and years as my first baby. And I'm trying Mm. to get away from that because- Well, because my business is not my baby. Like my business it. does not define who I am as a person. And when you're an entrepreneur and you're you're pouring into this this entity and you're trying to grow it and make it successful, um, I think I started associating. Yeah, I was like, this was my first baby. Then I had real babies, but no, it's not a baby. It's, it's, it's a business. And if I were to drop dead tomorrow, I would be sorely disappointed if what I was remembered for was being a great wedding planner. That would be, that would be sad to me. Mm. That, that is powerful because that speaks to me because sometimes I feel like, oh, it's just words. Don't worry. But you know what I mean? It's just words. It's not a big deal, but it is a big deal because you have been internalized. Has it, that been hard? My, here's my question. Has it been hard to stop calling a Southern soiree your first baby? No, I think it's- Oh, interesting. Do you I, think it's like time because it's been a decade? Oh, it's past time. I think more it's like, wow, this took um, years to get to this place and to start to look at my business from afar not from afar, but like start to, instead of holding my, oh, this is interesting. Instead of like holding my business inside me, like me, my business and I are the same. Like we are, we are one. It's like, I've pulled it out and I'm holding it in my hand and I'm deciding like what happens next with each decision that I make uh, with my business. It's, It's not a baby. It's not crying. It's, it's not living and breathing. It is something that, um, I'm proud of and I want to continue to grow and make smart decisions over, but the failures of my business, I can't own those as I'm a failure. And that took me almost a decade to get there. Mm, Your business failures are not your personal favor failures as a human being. 
Mm -hmm. Man, if you're listening to this, like own that, especially in this particular season, like the, the upset clients or the difficult vendor conversations or the cancellations or the client that doesn't book you, like all of those things are not a reflection on you personally. Like that's your business. That's, that's not you. It's, I believe, I believe that you can love your, love what you do. You can have those hard days. You can grow something, but you can't take it in so, so, so personally that your business owns you. And I can say for years, I have let my business own me. Mm. Can I ask you something? And uh, I don't. I feel like you have shared this publicly, but if you haven't, I'll just edit this out. Um, I know that you have taken a step back, like you're actively taking a step back from us. Is it okay if I share that? Yeah, of okay. course. Cool. <laughs> um, I thought it was, but um, anyway, so I know you have actively taken a step back in the last, what would you say, like 16 months? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 16 months ish from a Southern soiree, which was a full, like that was a full choice, you know, totally pre COVID-19, yes. um, fully formed decision. That was, that's been the plan for quite a while. Um, taking a step back, not being an active participant on the day of weddings, your team is taking it over. Do you feel like if you hadn't made that decision, like, do you feel like making that decision and then actually taking action on that decision uh, is what helped you start seeing your business, as you say, from an, the outside perspective and being able to say, yeah, it's not a baby. It is not, it is not just, it's not the only part of who I am. Like main, meaning if you didn't, hadn't made that decision and you were still like actively, you know, the lead planner, do you think you would have come to that conclusion? Yeah. I think until you can take a moment to pause and ask yourself, going back to what we said at the beginning of this conversation, what's your why and what comes next? I wasn't doing that until I'd say like things started to shift for me in 2016. So six years into business, like a a tiny little voice started talking. I didn't necessarily listen, but it, it started to get louder and louder and louder until I couldn't ignore it. But in, um, In my own business journey, oftentimes I've talked about the weed stage of your business where it's maybe you've been, you've been hustling, you've been putting in the time, things start to click, clients are coming in, it's growing, it's growing, it's growing. And all of a sudden you realize that you're in this place where you, again, like you are not looking at your business and actively making decisions on where it will go. It started to grow and there's weeds and, and, and it's growing in a direction that you may not have wanted for it to go. So you haven't taken the time or taken a step back to kind of prune it. And that is, um, that is one of like the biggest revelations that I've had as an entrepreneur in the last four years is you can't get so deep into the hustle and focused on the success and the number of speaking specifically for the wedding industry. I know early on in my career that success for me was defined by these, these numbers, the number of events that I had per year, Mm -hmm. the number of team members, the number of reviews that we got from past clients. Um, those would be like the three main markers. And I look at those now and I'm like, oh man, I wish I could go back and and talk to that Megan from let's say 2013 and, and advise her differently and how to look at success with her business. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I hope that if you're listening to this and you found yourself in that place, like that weed stage of business where it's growing, you're excited, the next event comes in, you're just hustling, but then you you find that maybe there are days that you're having more days where you're questioning the type of client that you're working with or the yes. type of event that you're taking on or whether, you know, there's been more days where you're unhappy than happy. Like the you might be in the weed stage. It might be time to really hit the pause button and, and figure out what comes next. Yes. 
Yes. You know, it's that age old, age old adage, like you can't see the forest through the trees because we're so, we're just in it. We're just in the grind or like in the slog and we don't take time because we're so busy with that. We don't take time to really actively look at our business. So like I said, one of the blessings I think of this period of time where things do feel so out of control and chaotic. A lot of us like, listen, I'm not trying to say that we're all not all, just, I'm not trying to say I'm over here like Zen having all of these revelations. That's not it at all. You guys, we are actively like postponing, rescheduling, having horrible conversations. Like, um, you know, it's been crazy. Uh, and I'm just trying to get through the year, but also, like I said, I think one of the benefits is if you can, um, taking, like you said, taking that active next step and, and figuring out, being able to look at your business. And, you know, one of the things you said that resonated with me, which is kind of another myth, I think, around being a small business owner in the wedding industry are the numbers that you said, you know, in those early years, the sign of success to you was like how much team you had, how many weddings per year you had, uh, so that you could tell people, you know, I have five as associate planners or I have 50 weddings on the books next year. I have, you know what I mean? And same for all of us, I think at one point or another, we're lying if we don't say that we, it feels good to be able to say, oh yeah, like we doubled our bookings or what have you. And right. so I think one of those myths along those lines is that like insert whatever wedding vendor you are, like six figures is the path to success. I feel like I mentioned that. Oh, I'm so tired of hearing that. I'm so tired of hearing that. And I, it's, I'm, t I'm tired of hearing it because the reality is it's just not based in any math. Um, it is purely a vanity metric. It's a vanity number. Now, listen to me. I am not saying that you shouldn't want to achieve a high salary for yourself, Dad, that you shouldn't want to, to achieve that, you know, a big revenue goal. Um, I like money. I don't mind saying it. I've said it before. But I think what's important is that there is no substance behind that monetary goal for some people because they just keep hearing this myth over and over and over again. So they build it into their psyche that that's where their value will come from. Once I get to this number, then I am a great business owner. And, and the truth is, is that you may not even need six figures. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know what I mean? You, if you actually sat down and ran your numbers do you know actually how much you make every month? Do you know actually how much in expenses, personal and professional that you have? Do you know what your P&L is every single month? Um, you know, I, like I said, I'm learning alongside with you. We have a pretty good idea what our numbers are. Not a pretty good idea. We have a good idea what our numbers are, but I don't even have a monthly bookkeeper and I'm terrible with our accounting. Like, I'll just be honest with you guys. And we've been in business for, you know, four years. Um, and we do well, but we're just like, la, la, la. <laughs> so, <laughs> I fall victim to that too, Kinsey. That's like a, that's my Achilles heel. Achilles heel for sure. But so I just think that I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong. This is just my opinion. I don't believe, and I don't feel that there's anything wrong of course, with having goals that are around metrics, that's actually helpful for having milestones. So of course, it's great to say my first year I booked 15 weddings. My second year, I doubled that to 30, but I spent 20% less on marketing. Like that's an amazing goal to have as long as you have kind of that double take, right? And you have those, you have substance behind it and it brings you joy. Mm -hmm. It actually brings you joy to reach that goal. Uh, and, and, and it also, you can also track why you didn't reach that goal instead of just feeling like shit about yourself pardon my language. So when you don't get to six figures, because you literally have no substance behind your goal, you just heard someone say that to you. So you think that's the thing. And then you don't reach it, but you literally have no idea why. Uh, and you're like, yep, I'm the worst. I'm a horrible person. Burn it down. Oh, and no. Yeah. You know, like, that's, and I that's think that's true. why a lot of businesses go out of business so early on. Come on. You, yeah. You start, you, you start getting the ball rolling and you have these metrics for success that, you know, perhaps are not attainable or just not based in where you really should be at year one, year two, You're like six figures. That's when I've made it. Or um, when I go full time, like that's when success is, but that shouldn't be just because you heard it on a podcast or you saw it in a marketing ad and that becomes your goal. Um, and I think that that that's what leads to a lot of business owners feeling like, well, I didn't make it. It's time to throw in the towel and give up. Yes. Yeah. Even though it was completely arbitrary to begin with. Right. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad we talked about those. I, I hope some of those myths resonated with you. Uh, don't hear what we're not saying. 
have goals, reach those goals, but have substance behind those goals. Make sure they bring you some peace and joy. And even just, it's okay to have some vanity goals. I certainly do. And as long as those bring you, as long as those goals bring you happiness, but what we, I, I just don't want to fall and for myself and for, for you listening, I just don't want us to fall victim to these myths of being a small biz- business owner, go out of business too soon, give up too soon, be stressed out when we don't have to be. Uh, I think it's important to put everything in its right place and not on a pedestal. Yes. Yeah. 100% agree with that. Yeah. So Megan, I, uh, it, I uh, confirmed this with you pre-recording. So I know we're going to share some stories here. Some of these are kind of personal, but we just wanted to kind of share with you guys some of the stuff that entrepreneurship, small business ownership has cost us in the past. And you know, some of the things that we quote gave up in the name of being a, I'm doing air quotes, like in the name of being the best business owner, we want to share some of the things that we gave up that entrepreneurship has cost us in the last, you know, over 15 years of combined ownership in the wedding industry specifically. Um, Megan, what, what if, what does entrepreneurship cost you? Give us some Mm. examples. Well, this is a hard question. I know. So entrepreneurship for me has been, it's had a lot of, of positives to it. And I think we'll talk about that as well. Um, but when I, when I speak on, I'm sorry, Kinsey, you're going to have to edit this part out. I lost my, uh, my train of thought here. That's okay. I might not edit it out just so you know, like it's real life here, people. (laughs) This is real life. Yeah. Entrepreneurship for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, that question is hard. Entrepreneurship for me has a lot of gifts as we have talked about the things that have been wins and and the high points of it. But I think for me, one of the biggest myths that I lived and breathed early on in entrepreneurship, and I still to this day find myself battling, is that it's possible to balance it all and do it all well. Mm -hmm. And when I say all, my all might be different than someone listening to this podcast. Uh, But all for me was um, being a a new business owner and being a mom and having a team and trying to build something that I was really proud of while also like just doing everything effortlessly. I thought that I could. And I set myself up that quote that was read at the beginning from Brene Brown, like that one hit me pretty hard because I, I set myself up for that and I put in the hustle. But what I found myself questioning years later is like, who was that hustle for? It was definitely for the perception of others. It wasn't internally, focused. It was more externally. And um, when I became a mom, two years into being an entrepreneur, in my own market as a planner, I was one of the first to add in motherhood to business ownership. And I remember that thought of like, oh gosh, I I know what people think. Like when someone becomes a mom, they they're gonna they're gonna drop off. They're not gonna be as relevant. They're not gonna be as successful. And I set my sights on that and thought, nope, not going to happen to me. I can do both and I can do them well. And I set myself up for some intense moments when, when you ask, like, what have I given up? Um, the, sh- the, short, <laughs> the short laundry list here is uh, I worked a wedding on my due date with my first daughter. I actually, like, told my couple – that my due date was two weeks later in hopes that I wouldn't stress them out. And I had a backup plan, of course, like I had someone that would step in, but in my mind, I was like, no, I'm working that wedding. Like I, I'm, I will be there. Uh, so I worked a wedding on my due date. My first daughter was born the next day. I had contractions all day while I was working that wedding. And I looked at that story for years, years as this badge of honor. And just in the last couple of years, it's, it's hit me like, Ooh, that, that maybe isn't something to be so proud of. Um, I did it again in 2014 with my my second daughter. I obviously had not uh, learned any lessons in that short period of time. Um, I have given up, obviously, a lot of 
weekends and family events, but that's part of the name of the game. Like that's, that is the wedding industry and it will always be the wedding industry. We work when others um, are celebrating. And when you get into the industry, you sign up for that. Um, But there are some, there are some other darker moments that I really haven't publicly shared with anyone. Um, I have shared it with you, Kinsey, as we, this podcast idea was born. Um, I had a, a miscarriage in between my daughters and I had to go in for a procedure. Uh, unfortunately, right before I had a wedding, uh, a really big wedding and I had that procedure. And then I turned around the next day and worked their rehearsal dinner. And then the following day after that worked the wedding and I never, I never told them. I never told the vendors. It was one of those things. It was that entrepreneurship at what cost and how am I going to balance it all and do it all well. So um, those are those are some of the things. I mean, there there are other um, smaller things, but they're still things that sit with me. Like I missed my first. Mother's Day with my first daughter because I had a destination wedding scheduled and I didn't realize it. <laughs> the date was Mother's Day until it was it was too late. Um, I worked a wedding six weeks after my first baby. Again, it was like, I can do this. I can handle it. I can be a great mom. I can be a great business owner. So if you're a mom and you are an entrepreneur, God bless you. Like it is, it is not easy. There is no perfect formula. There is no magic wand. I'm not sitting here right now saying, follow me. I've got it all figured out, but I have found some perspective and I have made active choices to change the future of what my script entails. And um, yeah, sorry, I think I'm, I'm, I got a little long winded there. Mm -mm. No, not at all. So, I mean, you literally lied to your couples and I think you lied to the vendors too. I did. And told them your due date was two weeks later because you were trying to protect them and their feelings and you had no care for yourself. I, yeah. I mean, I think I just didn't, I, I definitely wanted to put, I, I know the pressure and stress that a couple feels on their wedding day and the mm-hmm. idea of knowing that their wedding planner is due with the baby at the same time, like, oh my gosh, that's awful. I, w- I would hate to do that to someone. So I didn't, like I, I lied. I had a backup plan. Should I go into labor earlier? Cause duh, I'm a planner. Like, I'm not just going to assume that that, <laughs> that could go without a plan. But I also wanted the recognition. That's the part that is interesting to acknowledge out loud. It's like, yeah, I wanted the recognition of I'm a badass. Like I, I worked a wedding on my due date, had a baby, jumped right back in, did a wedding right after. Like, look, look at all the people that would say like, she's not going to be relevant. She won't continue on. Look, look what I could do. And that obviously, I mean, y'all can probably guess I'm a three on the Enneagram from that story. That's the achiever. Um, But I've been pushing back on that and that part, like just questioning. I've just been sitting. I've had the time since I decided to stop take weddings and stop taking weddings and determine like, what's my why? What happens when I die? Like what, what legacy do I want to leave? And that comes from some experiences I mentioned back in 2016 that that was uh, when that voice started talking to me. I had two, two separate clients like pass away unexpectedly. And um, it really, it's, it made me start questioning, like, why am I in the wedding industry? Uh, What is, what is my purpose? What's my why? Um, who do I want to serve? How do I want to serve them? And what would happen if that was me? Like, what if I, what if I die tomorrow? What, what, what does that mean from a mother standpoint, from an entrepreneur standpoint, from a leader? Those, those are the questions I've been asking in the last few years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you? I want to share, can we, can I deflect a little bit and Mm. (laughs) I'm passing the ball to you? (laughs) Um, I have given up nothing. My life is perfect. Uh, just kidding. Um, you know, when I, I don't know, I was trying to think like, 
what have I given up? Like what has entrepreneurship, what does small business ownership cost me? And because I am also a wife and a mom, my experience feels it's not the same as yours, but I think my questions have the same theme because my kids and my family are extremely important to me. Um, in the last, just in the last couple of years, uh, the last four years that I've had Vista View events, the wedding venue, I have given up stuff. I have, and I, and you, you kind of helped pull this out of me, but I, and there was one thing that happened to me that I hadn't fully, and I'm still working through it, you guys. I'm not trying to tell you that I'm totally over it. Everything's fine. Uh, I'm still working through what I lost and what that actually means. Uh, and so, you know, when we first started the concept of Vista View events was 2000, late 2015, um, and we got started like early 2016. And at that time, my youngest was four months old. And I was just telling my husband this the other day, again, because I've been reflecting. I don't remember Landon, my youngest, I don't remember him as a baby. Hmm. I don't remember his, I rem- my first Liam, you know, the fir- uh, for parents out there, you probably relate to this your first child's like all the things like taking Mm -hmm. pictures of all the bath times, first haircut, they get all the, you know, all the attention. Right. And I don't remember Landon as a little guy. Um, I, I have to, I literally have to look at photos and videos that we have so that I can remember what our day to day was because I was so busy setting up the back end of Vista view events. Um, and trying to get that business started. And and then, you know, we opened in 2017, but 2016 was all about construction, which my sister-in-law was heading up. She also has kids. Um, But, and I was doing all of marketing, all of the backend work, building our website. Like, am I a web designer? No, I'm not, but I was. Uh, And so I don't remember my son. I cannot remember. And I hate it. It breaks me. Like, I hate even talking about it because I am an eight and I don't want to talk about my feelings. (laughs) Um, and then, you know, a couple of years later, like, did I learn my life? This is all self-reflection now. Like I, in that moment, I didn't think that I didn't think I was missing out. I was just like, you guys, mommy's busy. Mommy's busy, you know, and I still do that. And that's yeah. shameful. I do that too. Um, and a couple of years later, we were full steam ahead. It was 2018. Um, we had a big season, like after our first season, we had an amazing second season. We were like, Oh my gosh, we're really doing this. And all of 2017, I was not feeling well. I didn't feel like myself physically. Uh, I didn't physically feel well, but I constantly put off going to the doctor. Finally went to the doctor to make a long story short. I had a mass on my ovary uh, and I was got really nervous about it because my, my family has a history of female cancer. So I was completely devastated and I was freaking out and really only my husband knew and my mom, I I didn't really tell anybody else how I felt on the inside and my friends, Tyson and Laura, shout out to them. Um, they're the only, they're the people who knew, like who knew my real feelings. Um, I hadn't really shared it with anybody else. And I couldn't find out anything about that mass unless I had surgery, um, which was a big deal to me because I've never had any surgery up to that point in my life. Like I still have my tonsils and my wisdom teeth. So not even tiny little, like I've never had a cat, you know what I mean? Like nothing, I've never had anything happen to my body. Like it has always just been a machine, like I'm not saying I'm in shape, you guys. I am not, but I don't let my body keep me down. Basically, is is the eight in me is just like keep going, keep going, keep going, and I was finally down, like emotionally and physically, because I thought I had cancer. I don't. Spoiler alert: I do not have cancer. I I never did, um, but I had surgery. I had this mass removed. I got the great news that it was it was just a mass. They I was able to save part of my ovary, but but what happened in that moment is that they said, listen you have this history in your family, you are clearly very nervous about it. We've learned that some cancers start in the fallopian tubes. Do you want to have those removed? And if you know anything about, you know, the reproductive system, if you have your fallopian tubes removed, you can't have any more kids. Um, And in the moment, I was so terrified and so emotional that I I pretty quickly decided that, yeah, yeah, (laughs) take those out. Mm -hmm. Um, Take them with you, you know? And this is, this is kind of what Megan has helped me work through is that, uh, I, I feel, a, a, I feel a sense of loss, um, because I was so scared in that moment that I made that decision really quickly and sorry guys, I made that decision really fast. And in that moment I knew it was the right decision, but now I have to work through all of that and realize that I can never have any more kids mm-hmm. and, uh, came up really fast and really unexpected. And when I was having that surgery and making those decisions, 
here's what I gave up in the name of being a great business owner. I scheduled that surgery and the recovery time. Um, I made no, I made no, um, what's the word I'm looking for, Meg? Like I made no um, consideration for right. like my emotional recovery. I you was just like, you buried that and yes, you put your you. business first and you you didn't let yourself even like process or grieve that decision in the moment. Yes. Thank you. That you, you can say that so much better. Um, I didn't, yeah, buried that made no consideration for that recovery. And I just focused purely on the physical and I planned that whole surgery and my entire, my entire physical recovery, the bare minimum, mind you, they were like, Oh, you should be able to lift some stuff in, in a week. Cool. See you next weekend at the wedding. Um, and I scheduled everything around wedding season. I did. I've never missed one wedding at my venue ever. Um, and I, so, and I was there, you guys, like I wore a dress because I couldn't have tight things around my body and I don't wear dresses to events because I don't, don't feel comfortable. That's the one time I've worn a dress. Um, I was still carrying chairs. I probably shouldn't have been according to quote, you know, what they say, but that's what I did. Um, and, you know, like I said, I'm, I've never missed a wedding at Vista View events. Um, until 2020 or excuse me, until 2019 when I did a whole wedding season because my business partner, we didn't have any staff at the time. Uh, she went on maternity leave, which I believe in. I, uh, believe in maternity leave and she went on maternity leave for almost the whole wedding season. We had almost 30 weddings that year. She did three of them. And those are the three weddings I've missed at Vista View events <laughs> because we decided to finally like, oh, we only need one of us because at that time we had we were still requiring um, external planners, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so we were like, we don't both need to be there. And I was like, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> and so I've, those are the three weddings that I've never been to. Wow. But I've done almost 30 by myself because even in year one, I did a few weddings by myself. Um, anyway, so I don't remember my child. I... I don't know. It's just, and, and I think what's important to, to say is like, it makes me feel emotional to talk about it. I did not see that coming. I'm sorry. I've talked to Megan about this a lot and I don't think I've ever cried. <laughs> My future life is uh, I'm going to be a therapist. And she needs to be honestly. <laughs> it's the voice. I'm telling you, I actually just listened to your solo episode about um, how to uh, increase your sales. Mm -hmm. You guys need to go listen to that, by the way, I'll put it in the show notes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Solo, solo episodes on weddings for real are like my lifeblood. That was you uh, talking me into that. I really don't like talking to just me in the mic. I would much rather talk to a person. I know, but you're so good at it. Thanks. You're so good at it. Yeah. You just need to keep going with that. All right. Stop deflecting. Back to okay. you. Okay. <laughs> Get out of my head. <laughs> uh, um, anyway, so I think that I'm not saying that, oh my gosh, I'm, I, I don't want to lie and say like, I am so glad I went through all of those things because, you know, I don't want to be so trite and just say, because I learned so much. <laughs> um, but I don't want to resent the past uh, because it's over. Like I'm, I'm not, I don't want to look back because I'm not going that way, but I do think it's important to process through my feelings. And that's kind of what like Megan has helped pull out and just to process, frankly, what I don't want out of my life. I do not want to have to make such important decisions on such a short timeline because I quote, don't have time for myself as a human being. I don't want to put off healthcare. Well, like I did all of 2017 because I'm too busy. I don't want to keep telling my kids like, mommy's busy, mommy's busy. Um, sorry, I don't remember you uh, <laughs> when you were a baby. Like, sorry, you know, heart, of, you know, heart of a mother. You can't have any more kids because that's what you decided. Mm -hmm. um, it's, that's bullshit. We don't have to do that. We don't have to do that. We, those, none of those things, by the way, you guys, and I, Megan, I think you'll agree, but none of those things that I went through the last few years and quote, in the name of being a better business owner grew Vista View events. Surprise. Mm -mm. Surprise. None of those sacrifices made a no. damn bit of difference in my business growth. No, I think my sacrifices led to extreme burnout. Like the, my, my, cho my choices. And that's where like, I want to own that. And what I would say to you, if you're listening to this and you are, are feeling any of kind of these just internal battles or struggles that Kinsey and I have spoke of is 
gosh, like instead of getting years down the line and reflecting like we are, that's where I think at the beginning of this episode, Kinsey, you talk about having goals and I spoke about, you know, understanding your why and making next steps. I think all of that combined to me, like a huge takeaway would be make sure you're constantly checking in with yourself. Like, Hey, Ooh, yeah. Hey self, like the last, let's say you do it once a quarter, right? Like you could go ahead and put it on your calendar and say, this is my meeting with myself. And <laughs> the agenda is like, how are things going? And unfortunately, those meetings would be a little rough right now in, in the current state because it's a shit show, right? Like, it's just a shit show. It's going to be a hard <laughs> monthly meeting you're going to have, but you have it anyway. I would do it once a quarter for sure. Don't go once a month right now. It's projections are still not good. <laughs> but, uh, um, it's been 30 days since my last meeting. Nothing has changed. <laughs> but let's say you do it once a quarter and the questions that you're asking yourself are like, am I happy? Like, are there bad days? Are there like stressful moments? Yes. But as a general rule in looking back over the last three months or six months, like, am I, do I, do I love what I do? Do I love who I'm working with? Like, does this, do I want to, you know, continue down the same path? Like if six months from now, I'm in the exact same place in terms of my business with maybe maybe you've raised your pricing or whatever. Like, is that okay? Is, is that good? And the answer could be yes, but like, what's, how is your balance? Like, are you, if I were to have done that circa 2013, I would have found the answer was no, but I didn't even do it because I was too busy hustling. I was too Mm -hmm. busy just grinding it out, like wedding after wedding. How many weddings? Oh, we have more weddings. Great. That's success, right? Those were the wrong questions to be asking. Like, oh, we're, we're charging more. Perfect. Like then let's keep going like success, success. And I wasn't like asking some of those harder internal questions that as entrepreneurs, we kind of push to the side. Like those are the things that you can see we're not asking yourself either. Um, and man, I hope this podcast is just kind of that little gentle nudge to to schedule a check-in once a quarter or every six months and and look at your personal life, like look at your, look at your business and, and assess back to the beginning what comes next. That's right. That's right. And I think the important thing to remember about those check-ins is it really depends on and I believe, I think this is kind of just the facts, right? Like let's, I love like facts and math and like analytics, not really math, you guys, gross. Um, But just like analytics and what it really looks like. And so I think one of the important things to do as you're, as you're doing these check-ins with yourself, which I hope you will, and I hope we all do, is just to remember where you are at in your business. Because the reality is where you are at in your business will kind of determine what moves you can make. So, you know, Megan has been in business for over a decade. Um, And so when she decides to pull back from weddings, that's almost not instant, but it's a, it's a lot faster. She can make that move faster than someone who just started their business, you know, 18 months ago or 24 months ago, because she has a bigger team. She has a lot more experience. um, She makes more money. Maybe her clients are more luxurious than yours. Um, And so just remember like logistically that these check-ins once a quarter are not to say you hate what's going on. So do a total, you're able to do a complete 360. You're not going to be able to do that for the simple, for a lot of reasons, but also just for the simple pragmatic fact that we work in an industry that works 12 to 18 months in advance. So it's likely that by the time you decide you want to make a change, well, you already got some weddings on the books that require you to stay where you are for those weddings. But now, as of today, your check-in, you can start making those changes. So I want you to have like grace. What I'm trying to say is we should have grace and patience with ourselves that our changes, unless they are harmful to your physical and emotional health, they may not always be as fast as you quote think they should be, but it's okay to just start. Like your pivot won't, doesn't have to be on a dime. It actually might be sort of like a slow burn, um, but you will get there. And let me give you an example from my own, uh, from my own experience. 
I can't, I couldn't change everything, you know, 2019 after 2017, 2018, and then 2019, I was, I was like, I know what I want. Um, and so what I, I had to share what I wanted with my business partner, because I have a business partner. If you don't good on you, because you can just make this choice for yourself. But I knew in that moment at the end of that season that I did not want to be at weddings every single weekend. That's not who I was. I didn't start my business because I love weddings. I don't, um, no offense to my couples. <laughs> I do, it has nothing to do with them. I just don't like weddings. Like it's not my thing. I have other, I have other gifts. <laughs> And so I, my small change, my slow burn, my short pivot was in 2019, I shared with my partner, uh, my business partner, my, also my sister-in-law that this truth the and the truth was, I don't want to be at weddings every weekend. I want to outsource. I am ready that I think our business is ready to grow that way. If you feel the same for you, great. If you don't continue to do your weddings, but this is what I want and need in my life. Um, and by 2021, I want to be at zero weddings. So the plan at that time was in 2020, I would only do 50% of the weddings I was, I booked myself. The other 50% would be outsourced. And then by 2021, uh, I would be completely extricated from weekends and I would go to zero weddings, zero rehearsals, that sort of thing. But you can see how I talked about it in 2019, but didn't have like the end, like the goal would not be completely realized until 2021. We have to make sure that we, like I say, have patience and grace with yourself and your pivot is sometimes a slow burn. It's not just a quick, like instant gratification. Well, that's the beauty of kind of checking in with yourself. Cause what, yes. what would be detrimental is if you get to the place where you're like, OMG, I cannot show up at another wedding. And you you run the risk of burning your business reputation to the ground or like, you know, burning out your business partner because you just stop and dump everything on her. And honestly, the irony of that is that's the business that I bought in 2010 when I took over ownership of a Southern's right. Like I- Interesting purchased a business from the original owner who maybe didn't do those check-ins and instead like got to the place where she was like, peace out. Here's some weddings. I'm moving to DC, like buy clients, buy vendors. <laughs> and that was my entry into the, <laughs> that was my entry into the wedding industry. So that's, that's what we don't want, right? Like that's, that's what, right. that's what you don't want. That's what I don't want. That's what you listening to this don't want is you don't want to get to the place where like you've been on that wheel. You're making those decisions, entrepreneurship at any cost, like success, hustle, uh, boss, babe, whatever those things are, you can have it all six figures. And then you're like, nope, peace out. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hi, I just lit a match to everything and I'm done, <laughs> even though that's not what I foresaw. Anybody want to buy my business? Megan exactly. of 2010 will. <laughs> Megan, yeah, I love how Megan of 2010 just scooped that up. Megan of 2010 yeah. took out didn't a small business questions. loan, didn't know the questions to ask, left a full-time great paying job and was like, cool, cool. I'm a wedding planner. Now. Yeah, I'll take it. Yeah. Is this your litter box? Put it in my car. <laughs> Can I give you some more money? Is that cool? Yeah. <laughs> I'll take it. Oh my gosh. Well, you know what I think is the silver lining is that we we have changed. We and we kind of talked about it a little bit throughout the episode, but we are actively making changes based on what we've been through and the choices that we made in the past. And I think Megan and I both are really passionate about saying like the choices that we made because we did. Like I don't like to say this is what happened to me. Nothing mm -hmm. happened to me. I made choices and there were consequences to those choices. And I'm just now realizing those consequences and I don't want those consequences anymore. Like I don't want to keep making the same choice. Like, you know, that's the definition of insanity. Keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So what are we actively changing? Like Meg, what are you actively changing right now? Uh, where are you headed uh, to further align with what you really want out of your life and out of your business? Yeah. Businesses. Great question. So um, super quick story. Back in 2017, um, I was, I had the agreement at my office. I had a um, check for another, like I, we had refinanced our house and I had this large check sitting in an envelope as well, getting ready to bite the bullet on signing a seven-year lease for a venue that was again back to... Um, 
that long-term goal of like, this is success. When I get to this place, I will have um, reached, you know, another goal that I can check off my list. Mm -hmm. I was also pregnant with my third baby and um, it was time to sign that partnership agreement. I had a partner. And that voice I mentioned earlier in this episode got louder and louder. Um, I ended up, this was like one of those major turning points in my career of just like, hey, what, where am I going? Where, what comes next? Is this still a goal for me just because it's been on my list for so many years? Um, and I walked away from that, not to say that that couldn't be someone else's goal and, and really be what they need to do and what they want to do. But for me, it was just kind of starting to question direction and um, turning down and walking away from that partnership and that venue, that seven-year lease. It's funny how things fall into place and you're meant to go down a path, but you don't always know what it looks like. Someone mentioned this on my podcast before. It's like you take that first step. You can't see what the whole staircase looks like, but you take that first step and then you just keep going from there. Mm -hmm. Um, That led to like that. No, I, I do believe like saying no to something creates the space to say yes to something else. So that no led to starting the podcast. It led to me meeting you. It led to um, one-on-one consulting with vendors because I had more space. I had more breathing room. I had more capacity. It led to saying, you know, okay, it's been nine years of weddings. Last last year, 2019, I decided to stop taking weddings, direct them more towards my team and go more after the consulting, education, and speaking side that I really love. Because Kinsey, you know how you mentioned that you don't love... um, Weddings, you, I don't either, actually. I don't love weddings. <laughs> I, don't. I, don't. I don't. I especially don't love weddings uh, in coronavirus because that's, that's rough. But what I love, that's my okay. why, my why, and like what gets me out of bed is the connection with people. Like just getting to connect with people, get to know them, like their inner quirks. And, and that is, that is my why. So I learned like weddings are an interesting side part of that because you definitely get to see the inner workings of people, the good, the bad, all the emotion and moments with weddings. But um, I really love the vendor side even more. So that's, that was a check-in with myself that I realized and it was a shift that I made and it was a, a collection of small decisions, not an instant like, bam, I'm out. It was a small choice of, I will stop taking weddings. I will complete the weddings that are booked. I will start a podcast. I will start doing one-on-one consulting. Then I found in that one-on-one consulting, I was saying a lot of the same things to all different vendor categories. Like I would talk to a photographer about the way to connect more with their clients or with, you know, form important vendor relationships, all stemming back to like the people side, the people side. And, um, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. I, does that answer the question? (laughs) Yeah, no, it does. And I like that you took what you are passionate about, what you, and it's not just you guys, again, because we both hate that stupid saying, ah, stupid. Like if you find what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And every time I say it, I have to say it like that because I just hate it so much. Um, And hate's a strong word. I don't hate it, but I dislike it. Uh, It's just so but so in the, at the risk of sounding a little bit trite, you took what you do, what you are passionate about, but also what you are excellent at. That's the thing. Like we have to find what we like, what we are good at, and then not even just good at because like what we are excellent at. And I think you've done that. You have pulled out what you are truly exceptional at, which is education, which is people, which is vendors, which is um, other human beings and human relationship. You know, I think that was really evident in our, in this conversation today. And there's the conversations that we've had, you know, you're able to, it's not always that personal, but you know, the fact that you're able to pull out of me, what I just haven't had, you know, what I have not allowed myself to, to emotionally grieve for or what have you, that, that, that says something about your it really just kind of props up as the foundation, what you really are exceptional at when it comes to people, right? And, I, you know, I see that a lot just because, you know, I get the pleasure of being a friend with you off, off of podcasting. And, and so I love talking business with you. Uh, you are probably one of the smartest people I know. Um, Megan probably doesn't want to tell you how many text messages I've sent her 
amid coronavirus like hey <laughs> uh my horrible person what's happening now uh what are you doing there no. in north carolina but uh <laughs> And I think too, I think too, is that you recognize, and and you've done this, you recognized that vendors, and I like this because uh, again, I don't like weddings, but I love talking to other vendors. I love being in, in the company of other vendors. And that's actually really hard to find though, because there is a specific balance between being able to support each other emotionally, but also let's grow our damn businesses too, though. I don't want to just come in and like, you know, squawk about, Mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. I want to grow business and I want you, that's what I like. Right. And I feel like you have a gift for creating a space that way. Thank you. Yeah. I, uh, I definitely, it, it was a journey to get there. Um, and it's, it's fun to find something to be like really passionate about and to be able Mm -hmm. to connect with vendors. And, and honestly, like this conversation to me with you, this is what it's about. It's about reaching other vendors in their journey and perhaps like they're listening as they're, you know, folding laundry or driving in their car or, you know, hiding from their kids in the bathroom, like wherever they are in that journey, it would be, it would be so fulfilling to me if they heard something that was like, dang, yes, I know this. Maybe you know it. Maybe it's been in the back of your mind. But I hope that this conversation that we've had has been just real, just open. We don't claim to know everything, but we're constantly trying to continue to learn and pour into ourselves so that we can pour into others, whatever the other is in your life, whether it's children or your significant other or your, you know, your team, or in my case, um, now it's other planners, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. I, um, well, you know, one of the things that I've changed in the last couple of years is just, I, well, it's since 2019. So I made that commitment in 2019 and I was steadfast in it. And I think that's one of the important things is that from your quote earlier is that validation is sort of, it's, it's elusive. It's not even a real thing um, because you can't control how other people perceive you and that, that we require like outside validation or sometimes outside permission to make moves. And I don't agree with that. I, again, that's probably the eight coming out of me because like, don't tell me what to do. Uh, But also we don't require external permission. Now there are key stakeholders in your life who you do need to come to an agreement with, you know, I don't just do stuff. Like the only person I don't talk to like that obviously is my husband. He's my husband. I respect him and I love him. So yes, he does have a, he does have like a key stakehold in my life and I, I do stuff. Um, we, we commit to decisions together. Right. But even, you know, my business partner, when it came to the knowing that, this is not what I am exceptional at. I also don't like it. And I'm missing out on key parts of my life and I don't want to do it anymore. Um, I knew that that was the right decision for me. And so what I committed to was sharing my decision because I owe that much. Yeah. I've made a commitment and it's another partnership that I'm in. Um, But I don't need to receive their opinion about it. Like I I'll listen to it because I respect that person, but I don't need to turn. I don't, uh, what's up. What am I trying to say? I do not need to take action on the opinions of someone who is not going to do anything about my life. Right. That's what I'm trying to say. Ooh, that's good. That's mm-hmm. what I'm trying to say. Like, I, I hear you, but I don't receive that into my soul. Like, I don't owe you anything. You're not going to come here and take care of my kids. You're not going to come be a wife to my husband, you know, anyone. Like, so thank you for your opinion. I also don't care. Mm-hmm. Um, I care up to a certain point and then after that. And, I, and, I, and I'm telling you that because for you listening, I want you to know that – Uh, It's easier for me to say no to people. It's easier for me to be like, don't care about your feelings. That's just who I am. Um, I'm not telling you it's the right thing. It's just who, what my personality is. So it is easier for me to say that, but I hope that maybe you hear this and you feel like, oh, like, yes, I need, I needed this burst of confidence. So just remember this, respect people. I like, I'm listening. I hear the words coming out of your mouth. And I, and I appreciate it, but I'm not going to receive that into my decision-making parts of my brain because you do not have a vested interest in my life. Mm -hmm. They're not going to take any action on your life. There's another great Brene Brown quote um, that I'll, we'll have to, I'll send you so we can put in the show notes too, but it's basically about you. If you are in the arena doing the work 
then you don't take advice from those in the seats outside, like just viewing. If they're not in there, like putting in the work as well, like their opinion, you can hear it, but you don't let it in. I love that quote so much. I'm going to try it at my internet's not very fast right now, but I was going to try to look it up because it really is so such good. a good quote. Yeah. Or I might be able to pull it up. That's so good. It is. Hmm. Oh man, you guys were yeah, just give us a timeout. Um, it's so good. Oh yeah, this is good. Hold on. <laughs> I think I have it. <laughs> Did you get it? Insert music. Do, 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 do. <laughs> oh, here it is. Okay. It's, I love it. Um, we've, we've cussed a few times on this episode, but it basically, it goes like this. If you are not in the arena also getting your ass kicked, I'm not interested in your feedback. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's I, good. I feel that on a deep level. I kind of want that on like um, something hanging in my office or I'm tattoo that on my body. <laughs> I love it. Just kidding. I'm not. Yes. I already had one tattoo mistake in my oh, life. Oh, here we go. Here's a follow up to it. But when we're defined by what people think, we lose the courage to be vulnerable. Therefore, we need to be selective about the feedback we let into our lives. For me, if you're not in the arena getting your ass kicked, I'm not interested in your feedback. Ooh, that that's sounds good. a lot nicer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mostly I just like the last part because <laughs> I'm, I'm a jerk. Uh, no, it's true though. It's so true. And and you guys, that's, um, I think the important thing to remember for me, is something that I'm just working through as I get older, is that we don't it's not necessary to be rude to people. I'm not actually going to say that to somebody. You know what I mean? Um, it's not necessary to say, I don't care about your opinion, right? Like that's, mm-hmm. that's just unkind and not necessary. Um, this is about you. This is just about you, the person. So focus on yourself and your reaction to thing and your actions, the next step, like Megan's been talking about. It's about us. Like um, it's, it's not about them. It's okay to be selfish in this scenario because like I said, we don't have to be unkind to people. We don't have to be, un, you know, ungenerous. Uh, we, I don't know if that's a word, um, but you know what I'm saying? Like we don't have to be rude. Uh, yeah. It's just about, it's about how we internally behave. Um, and what we choose to accept and what we don't choose to accept. But, you know, uh, I think we've talked a lot about kind of like what our hope is for our futures, uh, what we hope for you guys. Uh, we hope this was helpful and this was honest. I, I just want to say that, listen, I talked a little bit about this. Like Megan has this real gift for bringing people together who need support in a safe space. And but also who want to grow a business, you know, like that's so important to me. Um, so if you feel that way too, I would be remiss. I hope it's okay, Megan. I'd be remiss if I did not tell you about the planner's vault because it's getting ready to launch again. And the planner's vault with Megan's leadership has really been a cornerstone for me just because even if I'm not actively, you know, I, I'm not somebody who loves to comment every single day in a Facebook group, but I love to read and intake people's information. That's how I process. And so the planner's vault for me has been such a source of, of encouragement, but it's also been a source of ideas. Um, and there's, there's a, there's a lot more to it. Megan, kind of, if you would, I hope this is okay. Will you explain a little bit about the planner's vault? Because I want people to know what it is. And I think that it's never been more imperative to make an investment like this because you need growth material, no matter what stage of business that you are in, because we have hope for the future, right? We have hope for the future, but you also need a support system, a group, a community um, of people who are doing the same thing because even our spouses or our life partners, they can't be all the things to us, right? Like, and I, they, I don't, I don't, this is my personal opinion about relationships, but I don't think they should have to. They can't be like our partner and our life partner and our co-parent and, mm-hmm. and the person we vomit all of our business stuff on um, all <laughs> no, the time. you and I do to I, each other, yeah, right? You're my, you're my vomit bag. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Sorry. I might cut that part out. That's the <laughs> pull quote there. <laughs> Grab your vomit bag, everyone. <laughs> Okay, I gotta move off of that analogy. Okay, Tell us about okay. the planner's vault. Yes, thank you. Um, so the planner's vault is I said this at the beginning of the episode, there is no magic wand or pill that you can take that's going to make entrepreneurship easy. But the planner's vault I launched back in February of this year in 2020. And the goal was to create a safe space learning environment 
for up and coming planners. I geared it towards planners in year zero to five in business. We have some that are further down the line, but really it is a place to like build a community to learn and grow. And there are like there's, we do industry expert webinars twice a month on different topics because I've never claimed and will never claim to be an expert in all the things. Um, There's templates and documents. So there are the resources there, but my favorite part is that in this group, of currently 200 planners, like the uplifting and the cheering each other on and the supporting each other through what are really, I mean, hard parts normally, but even harder parts in in a pandemic and the successes, like being able to say like, okay, things are hard, but I just booked a new client. You know, what comes next? That has been... Um, that's the planner's fault. And it's, it's, you're right. The doors are closed right now, but they're getting ready to reopen August 5th and they'll be open for just a few short days. So if you're listening to this outside of August 5th um, and you're interested, I do have a waiting list that you can come join for when we will open back up again in November. Um, And Kinsey, you have been such an integral part of some of the things that you include for the members within the Planner's Vault. And uh, we're doing, we've, you've joined me for a webinar. We're doing an Ask Me Anything just on Facebook ads and marketing. And yeah, it's, it's the power of putting a lot of brains together to help each of the businesses grow. Mm-hmm. Oh, I like that. The power of putting a lot of brains together. Yes. I am a very proud partner and affiliate of the Planner's Vault and a member um, because I just like to, you know, put my support where my mouth is. I don't know if that's a saying. You know what I mean? <laughs> Guys, see, we're nearing the end of this interview. Yeah, we're going to so wrap this up We're just going to wrap this up before I get any further out of control. <laughs> Um, come join us in the planners ball. We'd love to see you guys there. It opens August 5th. That's 2020, but there's also a wait list. And listen, I mentioned the link at the top of the episode. I've also put it in the show notes so that you can easily find it. Or here's the great news. I am available all the time on Instagram. I love chatting with you there. So find me at she creates business. And if you need help finding the link, just DM me and say, Hey, can I have the link to the planner's vault? And I will give it straight to you one-on-one. I think you'll love it. I know you will. And if you're listening to this in the future, same link, just uh, click the link, get on the wait list and you'll know the next time Megan opens it up. Yes. And that link just, um, I I just double checked it for you. It is the planners vault.com slash she creates business. So we're keeping it simple. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Megan Gillikin, host of Weddings for Real podcast and the owner and lead planner extraordinaire of a Southern Soiree. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kinsey. You're the best. You're the best. We'll see you later. Thank you so much for listening to She Creates Business. Please take a minute and head to iTunes to leave an honest review so we can help more wedding pros find the show.